Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Influencing Safety with Bill Martin, the president and CEO of Think Tank Project LLC. I'm Kate Wade, the editor of Incident Prevention Magazine and your host for this podcast. So one thing you may have learned about Bill over time is that he is an avid reader. In our offline conversations and in just about every installment of Influencing Safety, he mentions various books that have influenced the way he thinks about safety in our industry. Because of that, we both thought it would be a great idea to talk more in depth about some of those books and how they've helped to shape his vision. Now, without further ado, let's jump right into it. Welcome back to the podcast, Bill. Thanks, Kate. Nice to see you. It's nice to see you. How have you been? Good, good. Uh, I, I liked it when we were in San Diego because it was 3D. This is It was 3D, and it was real, It was even easier to like connect and sync, right? Yeah, and if, and if I don't have forgotten, I just wanted to thank you for these opportunities because honestly, if you look at the statistics in our industry, we have to start thinking a little bit differently in, in order to change them and not it's really easy to get sucked into the rituals, you know, when we just keep doing the same thing over and over. So this is an opportunity to think about how we'd influence people. So I really appreciate this opportunity to buy forward. Well, we love having you here. Um, your your perspective is always so interesting to me and I know to our readership. So I appreciate you um, beyond words being here as much and spending as much time with us as you do. Um, so do you want to talk about the list that you kind of put together today or how you need to sort of organize um, some of these books that you want to talk about? Yeah, this, this was, this is hard because like you mentioned, I do, I, I think I would need to talk about a little bit about the story of w- w- why I'm reading um, and what kind of led to that. Um, let me tell a short story here. I, I heard a story today, man, a, a contractor was working on the storm and it, one of the blind men had the cheat saw hanging from his bucket and it fell to the ground and smashed. Mm-hmm. What we do now is we have a process and a system. You know, we have a uh, an investigation, so whether it's tap root or bow tie, whatever formula they want to use. Mm-hmm. That all of our companies use to now investigate this incident because it was a near miss, right? It could have landed on somebody, hurt somebody, and that's serious. Of course, we use, I just wrote, wrote the article that I think is, is that going to be in this magazine in February or no? Yeah, it's going to be in February about yeah. modern disruption. No, modern disruption and not asking the five whys. So by the time we get done asking these this lineman the five whys as to why he did this and why he did that, he's in full defense mode. And then, um, matter of fact, I, the guy who dropped the thing tried to take the day off because he was so not looking forward to the investigation and all those questions. On the other side, the management that's asking the questions has the best intent. Right. right. They, they're using a system and process that we have in place. And that system and process says to ask five whys, which I'll explain in that article, not today, but if you read the article, why that causes defense. And he instead is moving to rationalize the designation and justification for what he did, which is all in the past. What we want to do is just figure out what thing he would have done differently to make it not happen, which is in front. So I, as I see the outcome of this, the perceived outcome of management is that that was a really learning opportunity and we got a very rich discussion. But the worker view of it is, um, I, is I'm frustrated to keep asking me why and uh, it, and, and, and it's the same as last time. Mm-hmm. Uh, another company, one year I worked for had uh, 28 unplanned outages. I mean, wow. 28 tap root investigations. And at one point I try to bring everybody's attention that, you know, this process we're using isn't been, it hasn't been awfully successful to stop the next outage. At some point we need to look at our system and process. Yeah, but this is what we do. And it becomes like a religion. It becomes a ritual. Mm-hmm. So that type of realization of re- the reality and, and the dichotomy between what we think is happening and what the team, the crew is feeling drove me to try to look a little bit as what influences are human being, you know, and and a lot of safety people are reading things like Sidney Decker, a uh, really interesting guy from Australia, that's Todd Conklin, who does a lot with human performance and the hop principles, Leif Babin and Jocko Wilnick Wil- 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 that did uh, extreme ownership. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll use that for an example. There are some places doing whole programs based on Jocko Willink's book because it's good, very motivation, you know, but that's only one narrow perspective. 
of extreme ownership. So what, what I've been doing, I, I have a ton more books than we're even going to talk about today, but our perspective changes. I, I think I told you this quote earlier. Einstein said, a mind stretched to a new shape never regains its original shape. Yes, so I love read, that quote. Yeah, I, I will read a book, and I, so I read a lot of books I don't like, uh, but I, I read them anyway because I need the bandwidth. Well, yeah, the hamburger bandwidth, right? right yeah. Right. Because it's not about just the good books that I like. It's about all the information. Mm-hmm. And I don't have to like it. I just have to try to understand why somebody is writing about it. And then I'll go read a bunch of other books. And I'll come back and reread that book because I reread almost every book. Because I run out of books because I read a book a week. So um, I'll go, before I get another book, because Audible only gives me one credit a month, I'll go back <laughs> and read other, other books rather than spend more money. And every now and then I'm really into it. I'll buy another book. But the book I read for the second time isn't the book I read the first time. Because now I have this other information to apply to what I'm learning. Some books I didn't like when I started, I now like because I have a different perspective. So I, what I would encourage uh, your audience to realize is that when we understand more about how our brain actually works and, and the science of how we are, humans are interacting, then we'll start realizing that some of the things we're doing are really unsuccessful from the beginning because it doesn't coincide with how we work. Right. So mm-hmm. that investigation about the chainsaw, now they have to come up with the lessons learned and figure out how to apply and translate what we learned into a change at work. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it works. Sometimes we create a little different lanyard or we create something that gets applied to across the board. And that's a physical change. But more often than not, it's a concept. And, and uh, workers tend, having been alignment for 20 years, tend to not want something to think about. They want something to do, right? Yeah, that makes sense. And they're already turned off a little bit because they, they, there's a storm and they go to work for one one client and the client has their own onboarding and their own safety culture and they have to sit through that. And then in the middle of the storm, they're done. So they go to a different utility because they need more help. They got to sit through their onboarding and their safety culture before they go to work. The work is the same, but the, the crews are constantly bombarded by an imagined set of beliefs that is built in the structure of that client. Mm-hmm. Now, that it can comply with all those things, uh, but it what it really does is kind of makes them a little bit learned helpless because they, they start just waiting for this to be over with so we can get to work. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So that's kind of what drove looking for these books. And, and I'm going to just briefly, and this is not going to be a book report. I don't want to put your people to sleep. This is just going to be a brief overview of some of the titles, and I promised I, I would get a link to some of the book, least the books we talked about today. I would love that. Yeah. But, we want to be able to share. But there's a ton of other books that add context to this, and sometimes context means everything. I'm not going to talk about, you all know Harari's book, Homo Sapien, uh, or Sapiens. Um, it's a, Really, it's a brief history of humankind. We start to understand where we came from and how we evolved in the last 100,000 years. It gives you perspective. And then he wrote another book, Homo Deus, that I'm not going to talk about, which is a brief, brief history of the future of human kind. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, um, and, and there's a whole bunch. There's there's tons. I, You know, Nicholas Taleb, the, the Black Swan, I really didn't like the book. But the Black Swan, the swan is that unexpected event. That chainsaw falling off the bucket is a Black Swan. It doesn't happen very often. But we spend all this energy and time to prevent that thing that never happens to happen ever again. And then we do eat and get worse. We attest the reason it doesn't happen for the next month because we just had this meeting. Mm-hmm. Right? There's no correlation there. Um, so it, it's it's the same reason we talked about and I've written about why the job reefs are all different for every company because we think that changing the job reef makes it safer because that event had to happen because it was the job reef is not quite up to par. Right. But the job reef really had nothing to do with the incident. Right. Because so we, we it's, it's a logical fallacy. You can look those up. I'm not going to do those today either. So, so where do we start? Uh, I, I started looking. What do I need to know? So, I, the first book I want to think it's a big book. The first book that I decided to read was was by uh, Andre Viscontis. Was written in 2007, published in 2017. Brain myths exploded: lessons from neuroscience. Ooh. And, and what I really liked about the book is how simple it was. She's an opera singer, and she read the book, so she's really her voice. She's a good voice to listen to. But I like them. I mean, they're really simple. Like, are bigger breeds smarter? You know? Um, are they? Uh, no. No. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but there's, there's, you know, there's all kinds of things about the lizard breeds and all this other stuff that are all myths. And it's 
interesting when you actually hear the studies that they did to determine um, what these brain myths are over time that we believed and aren't true, right? Um, one of the most important things I got from the Brain Myths Exploded book, and, and I would I wouldn't suggest that book to any of your any of your listeners that are interested in just getting a base knowledge about the, how the brain actually operates, right? Because like right now, you're listening to me, mm -hmm. and I'm, you're not hearing my words. I'm vibrating the air between me and my microphone. It's mm -hmm. traveling to you as a wave coming out of your speaker as 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 a and it's vibrating the air there, vibrating your eardrums. And your eardrum is vibrating, creating electrical and chemical signals that go to your brain to interpret these words as English. Um, that, that's, that takes time. And what we think is we think our brain is waiting patiently for that to be figured out, but um, there's more going on because our brain isn't just doing that. It, it, and this is what I learned in, uh, in Andre Vistadis' book is that our subconscious processes 11 million bits of information per second. And our conscious only 40 or 50 things a second. So that means your brain is resourcing information from all over. Kind of like if, if you were counting on the speed of your conscious thought and you were the pitcher and you had a line drive hit at you, you would just be frozen watching it pass you while your brain was calculating what you were going to do. So from practice and experience, there's all kinds of other things that happen. And your reaction bypasses your prefrontal cortex, uh, doesn't even go through your conscious thought. So when we're having this conversation, there's all lots of other stuff going on that's affecting your decisions on how you're going to respond. And we're not we're not aware of them. And that's where the hamburger bandwidth came from, right? Because, <laughs> because what we were just talking about that in our house last night. I taught my husband the, the hamburger bandwidth. <laughs> right. Because when, when there's a lot of reasons. We like things when you when you ask somebody you know do you like hamburgers and they say yes and and I've done this to your race so I won't do it to you again because I don't <laughs> want to go nuts but uh, and, and I say well I'll ask people well why how do you, how do you know it was good and they'll say well because I like it was tasty it was just the right tension it was tender it was juicy had just the right things on it and then I always tell them the same thing well that's really interesting but you don't decide if you like that a hamburger based on taste it's it's because you've you've had a bad one. And your your subconscious, without any cognitive load, um, will list and rank it with one bite, right? That, oh, this is really good. Not as good as Joe's, but 10 times better than those other pieces of crap, right? So, <laughs> so, so you create the hamburger bandwidth. And it's not based on just the hamburgers you like. It's based on all of the universe. So that idea that comes to your consciousness from your subconscious comes from all of the stuff. So ideas are the same. Your good idea isn't coming from your genius. It's coming from your subconscious and all of the information. Um, I, I think I've told you the story once. I was with an EMT, pretty new. That really said something completely wrong, but it triggered something in me that made me realize this person was much more ill than I thought based on that person's pair, right? Um, they basically said, oh, good, this is a trauma. Oh, good, I, we've stripped him down. If there's no bruises, I don't see any broken bones. But the guy's partially, you know, in and out of consciousness and moaning. I said, oh, no. I said, uh, that means it's visceral. I mean, that the fact that we can't see it means it's on the inside. So yeah. that's just the first book. It's It, it, it kind of gives you, it's an easy book to listen to. It's not technical. Uh, and it kind of explains very and kind of simple little funny chapters how your brain works. Uh, I like that. Um, so, I mean, I don't know how much you've read. Have you much, read much neuroscience? I haven't read a lot of neuroscience, um, not like actual books. I've read a lot of articles and, you know, obviously edited quite a bit of stuff that has come through um, that we've published in the magazine. But uh, I know that I learned so much from you when we have um, these conversations, when we're prepping for these conversations. I, um, it almost feels like I'm learning through you vicariously. So I don't need to read the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, so this book is not on my list right now, but I'm going to say it anyway, because it was in one of our first podcasts we did when I started talking about trust. Uh, Dr. Paul Zapp wrote the book Trust Factor. Um, I'm not sure what year that was, but he also did a Harvard Business Review article, The Neuroscience of Trust. And we talked about how trust is actually oxytocin. And there's also things, when you read it, listen about chemistry, 
in Dre Viscontis and Brain Myths exploded. We'll talk about dopamine also. Those things enhance our ability um, and, and bond, help us bond with each other so we can connect better. Um, so that's part of the neuroscience work. And if we're not using the knowledge from that neuroscience to get help as a leader to help get ourselves connected, we're missing a really good opportunity. So I, I, some leaders think coming there, but kind of pounding your fist on the table and yelling at somebody is how you connect with. Um, that might be in the military where you have a you have you, you, you have a volunteer group of permanent employees. If you like, but but in uh, in reality, that doesn't work. You know, that that when we move into a, like a defensive posture or a fear posture, we're operating at a lower level, and that's well. Well, I haven't read a lot of neuroscience, but I know one thing that I often talk about in our conversations is about um, therapy. Like people who go to therapy, if you have a good therapist, I know one of the things that I learned from all the years that I've been in and out is um, that they will talk to you about how your brain functions, right? And teach you ways to kind of rewire or build, you know, um, new neural pathways to kind of change your behaviors or how are you responding to other people's behaviors and things over time. So, and I know that the therapy thing always, you know, sounds woo woo to some people, but I really do think that what you learn in therapy has so many applications, not just in your personal life, but also in your professional life. And there's a lot of crossover between what you talk about on these podcasts and like what I've experienced being in a therapist's office. So that's a good analogy because what what, uh, what happens when you learn something in therapy and then they, the only time it changes anything is when you start to apply it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a quote I checked with ChatGPT yesterday. Um, Information is not knowledge until it's implemented or applied, right? Because mm -hmm. I had asked ChatGPT if, that, if that's logical and they, it confirmed, it, it did a logic test on it. So you, what, the therapy is good. If somebody gets therapy and they don't apply anything to get in therapy, they should expect nothing to change, right? Absolutely. Yeah, you have and to do the work. So it takes it takes an involvement, um, and I, I think I'm going to skip to a book that I wasn't going to go to. But another neuroscientist, uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett, um, from Yale, wrote the book Seven and a Half Lessons on the Brain. And what, that's, wait, what's the half lesson? There's a half lesson. The, yeah, there's a really short lesson. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. so it's it's really it's a good book. It's another book that kind of intermixes how our brain actually works. What really affects us in different ways, and, and you know, we think uh, that our emotions. She talks about this in the book. And this is what I got from her: is that our emotions are internal. So I'm. This is my emotion, but it's completely wrong. Your emotion is totally external and totally immediately affects the person you, you are engaged with. Ellen, they their behavior changes as a result of your emotion, and you have no control over that. It's kind of like uh, in Dana Kahneman's book, which we'll talk about in a minute: Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, he talks about, you know, there's, there's involuntary things that occur. We have no choice. I tell you, don't think about a white bear. Um, <laughs> Obviously, I just thought about a white bear. So okay. Right, right. You yeah. not see a white bear, right? So <laughs> so our emotions, the same thing. When we show up with an emotion, you know, this is my emotion. The only way we can unhack that, oh, this is another book, I can't remember which one right now, is is to acknowledge that we're having that emotion. So our subconscious can create a path around because its job is to keep you alive and make you successful. Mm -hmm. And if you think you are your your emotion, then you're going to respond with a reaction. Um, so the thing about when you start learning about biology, like in uh, the brain that's exploded, your reaction um, is a biological response. Mm -hmm. It's it, it's so we, we are designed to respond to either freeze or run for our life. Uh, and defend ourselves, and that's an amygdala or a sympathetic response. It's all part of our body. Of course, I'm in medicine, so I I know some of this medicine anyway. Increases your heart rate, moves all your blood to your to your muscles, all that kind of things. But but when we get therapy, we start to realize I'll use your therapy example that we are not our emotions. That's a reaction. So then, who are we if we're not our emotions, right? And this is into some of the other books that I read that I'm not going to even talk about today because they get a little bit heady. But the reality is I'm asking people right now, I'm trying to find out what age realizes this. 
I think I've asked you this already, right? I ask people, you know, you know, can you hear me speaking, Kate? Yes. I'm not, okay. Um, say podcast. Podcast. Now say it in your head. Okay. Did you? I did. So when I ask people if they if they're aware of the voice in their head, some people say no, and I'll ask them to say a word and say it in their head and, and not say it. Are you aware? You and I'll say, oh yeah, I did say that. In my head. Great. I said, so are you aware that you are not the voice in your head? And then I'm doing a little anecdotal research on that, and a lot of people are like, what are you talking about? I said, well, you are the one that's aware of the voice in your head. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the same person. I said, is it? I said, when you're driving the car down the interstate. And you're deep in that conversation or listen to that music and your conscious and mind is on on that conversation and you miss the exit who was driving <laughs> right because if that's both of you then one of you is missing for that that scenario well, do you ever know that thing and like maybe this is often left field somewhere but like i have this thing where like if i go out on a, like a balcony or something on a really tall building my brain is like oh you should like stand on the railing and like see what happens and i'm just like why would I do that? No. And it's like, I'm freaking myself out. And I think that's like that other voice that's like, oh, wouldn't that be interesting if you tried that? And I'm like, yeah, that's probably not going to happen. So, but the, the reality is, Kate, the one who you are is the one who's aware that you're having that conversation in your head. <laughs> right? It gets a little headache. So, and why is that important? Um, I'm going to jump to another book really quick that I didn't write down either. Victor Frankl wrote Answer. I, that's what. Yeah, that's what I was just thinking about, about the gap, about the space. Yes, yeah, so please, Frank, go ahead. Victor, Victor Frankl wrote Man's Church for Meeting. He died in 1997. He lived through four Holocaust camps. He was, a, he was, I think, a neuroscientist, psychologist during the Holocaust, born in uh, 1905, I think. And he survived four different Holocaust camps. And in that book, he's got a quote that says, there's a space between stimulus and response. In that space is our power to respond. And in that response is our growth and our freedom. Mm -hmm. I, I really liked the book. First half of the book was all about his experience. The second half was all technical about the studies he did afterwards. And I didn't understand those really, but I, it, it was worth reading the stories in the front. Mm -hmm. But when you are aware that you are aware of the voice in your head, you've just created a gap between who you really are and your emotion. So if you know that I'm getting triggered, I'm, I'm feeling frustrated, you can slow down long enough. I like to use the five second rule, count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. That's also a TED talk by somebody. And then respond the way you want to respond, not the way your biology wants you to react. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of world I want to live in, which is why I'm researching this, because when we do that, we, we start finding solutions because we're operating at a higher plane. We're not defending ourselves and arguing because we want to, we, we seem to want to take the position that we're right. I don't, well, yeah. And I don't need to be right. <laughs> I got need to be curious and interested why somebody as you is thinking something different than somebody like me. And when we combine that, we're working through solutions that we can apply to that space. So that's well, and I think that also creates the psychological safety that you talk about. When you and I are in a conversation and I take a moment before I tell you, you know, what I want to say, if I don't trust you, if you haven't made me feel safe, you know, my reaction is probably going to be different. So it all kind of connects. So, all right. So now I'm going to, so I'm going to mention that book that I didn't put on my list. Yet. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, so Amy Edmondson started this whole psychological safety thing with, uh, uh, what was her book? Fearless Organization. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I, and I read that book, but Timothy R. Clark came out with a book for stages of psychological safety, which I've talked about before. And that's what you're talking about. And if we look at that as a maturity matrix, I really liked the book for this. This is what it did to me. It was that every, either your family, your book club, your work, your crew, your every every organization you belong to has a maturity matrix that'll fit that. First, it has to be safe to be included. If it's safe to be included, it can become safe to learn. You'll know if it's not safe to learn because people get beat up um, every time they make a mistake, right? Once it's safe to learn, it becomes safe to contribute. After it's safe to contribute, it becomes safe to challenge the status quo. And what we're looking for is we want people to contribute because we want to increase our hamburger bandwidth. Right. Mm -hmm. The more information we have, the more we have to 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 figure out where we need to go. When we only have a limited amount of information, it's not good. So, back to Lisa Feldman Barrett for a minute. The other thing that she did for me was she started talking about social reality and physical reality. Mm -hmm. That we, you know, we're driving across the border from the United States into Canada. There is no border. That's the constructed social reality that we made real in a physical reality. Right. Right. Um, we, the, the earth 
is revolving around the sun and a certain part of that arc is January, right? We call it yeah. January. Now, but it's not January. It's just to work on the arc, that, but that's a social reality, social construction. What, I'm, what I've come to the realization from reading these books is that there seems to be in our, in our, our society right now a blurred line between what's social reality, what's physical reality. And the workers work in physical reality every day, right? I think I've told you this, like a Jew, a Muslim, and a Buddhist, and a Catholic, and build a house together with the same pile of tools. Yeah, because the pile of tools and the house live in physical reality, just like the power lines and, and substations are, the utilities people are building. And those things don't care what you believe or think, right? We can have different beliefs and maintain the same objective, you know, contrary to what you're watching in the world right now. Because what we think, we teach our children, you know, to be kind to your neighbor, don't blow them up with bombs and don't shoot them. And then our tax money goes to blow people up and shoot them. So I think there's a dichotomy there we need to we, we need to come to terms with. The physical reality, the social reality that we're teaching is not the physical reality we're displaying. And that, cre that, that creates a problem in society. Well, it's hypocrisy on some level, and that just never sits well with people. Right. So I am zero. I mean, I can't have any control over that. I can try to vote. And even that, I'm not sure what it does. But but the the reality is- Don't say that out loud. <laughs> what, 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 well, I mean, I'm going to vote just because it seems like the right thing to do, right? But, well, it is the right thing to do. Yeah. And, it is, and it's the only thing we can do. <laughs> so, right. If you, I mean, you can't complain if you don't even go out and vote. So- yeah. So, so I, I agree with you. I didn't mean to be so negative on that, but, but the, 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 the reality <laughs> is, though, I... our workers live in physical reality. And then we come up with a social construct. You know, it's like it's really important that they learn well personality traits and disc profiles and learn about the hot principles and all these things. There's so much really rich information out there to learn. But like I said at the beginning, information is not knowledge until you translate it to an application or, or, or implement something based on that. Yep. So we think we're done. We also think that motivation, I can have somebody come and talk to me that's suffered a terrible thing. I mean, businesses do this. They have people come in and talk to their peers that have lost arms and, and, and it's terrible, very motivating. But unless they give them something to translate that to something to do, it's just a good story. Mm -hmm. right? It's like going to the movies and we laugh, we cry, we get excited, we get sad. And then we go to work and nothing changes at work because of the movie. So what I'm looking for are how do we train? And it's, I mean, honestly... I have to apologize to some of the people that are even listening. Some of you are getting frustrated with my question because I ask the same question over and over, and it, I don't mean for it to make people frustrated and angry, but it's a hard question. The question is, this is really good information, and it comes from Peter Drucker, actually, some years oh, yeah. ago, when he said, uh, oh, this is what somebody patted him on the back. So that was a really great meeting, Peter. He said, was it? He says, yeah. He said, well, what's going to change your work on Monday as a result of this really great meeting? So... In other words, what, how do we translate all this really good information to a physical change at work so something can happen? Because if you don't translate it, if you make it random, it would be like, I want to get a bit of violin. I think I'll practice Monday and maybe next Thursday. You know what I mean? <laughs> you get if, we, if we create a pattern, this is something really interesting I've just read. And this is uh, a book that I didn't plan on telling you either. The Hour Between Dog and Wolf. I think it's John Sloat. Uh, I think it's 2021. Uh, it's a free download on Audible. Nice. He was he was the guy who was uh, a market trader and also a neuroscientist at Cambridge, and and the risk taking it on the floor creates certain hormones to be produced in us. At the same as risk taking in real physical life, and mm -hmm. he kind of shows that the, the 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 commonalities between risk taking, regardless of, the, of, the, of where you are, and then the patterning. That happens when you create a pattern like utility work is very much pattern you know a substation is a substation a pole line is a pole line there are very built variabilities in it but the more patterns you are the more reliable your intuition is and then that means when that thought comes to your mind without your permission from that 11 million bits of information you need to weigh it and at least take a moment and not jump forward with a baby or it should be you know what i mean it's uh and that that came from that book so i'm i'm still kind of raffling ruffling through these books but Early on, um, so Lisa Feldman Barrett's a really good book. It's a simple book. She's another Yale graduate. Uh, uh, text kind of goes along with uh, Viscontis' book on greenness. Um, only Lisa has a little bit of a different view. She gets a little bit into social reality and physical reality, which I think is really healthy. I think if we start to understand that division and teach it to our younger people, 
Mm -hmm. Start making decisions based on the physical outcome, not on our perceived belief. And that's where we're running into a, di a problem. Our perceived belief is that teaching you human performance is going to change something at work, but we can't nail down what that changes because it's just a belief. But if I give you something to do every Monday, that this is what you're going to do because of we want better human performance. We're going to have you stand in a circle and acknowledge each other, uh, smile for a minute, and uh, identify your role and your, and your concern today. We do that every day. Maybe let's do it every day right after the job brief. I create a pattern that generates new intuition and new thoughts, and, and it creates a competition because linemen are type A and chili workers that work outside, and they, they know it's coming, and they want to have the best, the best concern, right? They're thinking, well, oh, I want to have the best concern. What's it going to be? <laughs> and then we are looking, when we're looking for concerns, a concern, let's define a concern. A concern is a prediction of an unwanted outcome. And until yeah. somebody raises that concern, and why I say raised is because it comes up from the gut, right? Mm -hmm. it, um, all of these neuroscientists talk about gut instinct to be now is a real thing. There's neurons in your gut that report to your brain just like your vibrating eardrum does. And, and, and the cones and rods at the back of your items. And when it reports to your brain, um, there's information in there. And one, one uh, Tara Schwart, was, she wrote the book, The Source. I didn't write that one down either. But, uh, but she, she talks about how she takes, when she travels and speaks a lot, she gets her gut bothered. You. So she takes probiotics. But she's learned because of that lack of communication in her upset gut, her intuition isn't as good when her gut's upset. So fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So they, I mean, this, these are scientists. This isn't. I had somebody accuse me. Well, well, these pop psychologists and pop, and I listed like twenty names of doctors from PhDs. Saying I'm not sure these people want to be called pop anything. No, they're the real deal. So, so the question is this, Kate. I can have all the information in the world and the smartest stuff, mm -hmm. but if I can't translate it to you in a way that you value and understand it, nothing changes in your world, right? So how I influenced that got to be one of the things that I started really questioning in myself. Am I having any influence? Which is where we started our discussion, which is the title of this podcast series, is Influencing Safety. Because mm -hmm. th th we know why we need what to do. We know what we want to teach. But how the information comes across sometimes is a delusion. We, we see there, I told you, right? And that's why I said before, a lot of times, the, if, if you boil it down on the answer to complacency is don't be complacent. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. well, yeah. Yeah. The answer to uh, on the incident investor, you lost focus. That's what happened. The answer to losing focus is pay attention. No. There, we solved all that, right? And that's if you boil a lot of whatever what we're doing, it comes down to a logical fallacy. But it sounds good, right? And it, well, yes. it's, and it's easy to say, right. you know. And and that I learned from the next book, um, which I'll get to in just a minute. But if you want to learn about influence, Robert Cialdini. Uh, he's a 2021 influence new and expanded the psychology of persuasion. Really interesting, all based on studies. And if you want to be more persuasive, we need to affect each other's brains in a positive way, not a negative. If I put you in defense, you're going to go to rationalization and justification. If I'm curious and interested and ask you in a way that's trying to ask like how and what questions, not why, you know, now how did you see this playing out, Kate? And, and what do you think happened that made it not play out the way you were looking at? We start looking at logic, reason, and intuition, not rationalization and justification, which is a higher level thought pattern. Um, Terrell, Terry Shout, Sherrod, she wrote Optimism Bias and uh, the Influential Maya and What Our Brain Reveals About Our Power to Influence Others. She's really easy to listen to. Um, and she took her, her, like, one of her chapters is Why Do Babies Like iPhones? No, she had a baby. <laughs> and she's trying to, you know, she's, she wants to have a, a, not a not a regular name for her baby. So, she has a whole list of things that are going to trigger her name, like a salt shaker and all these things, and an iPhone, because she's always had her iPhone with her. And every time she did it to try to get to see what her baby would grab for, it kept grabbing for the iPhone. Because the baby was interested in what she was interested in, and her yeah. interest wasn't in any of those things. It was the iPhone, right? So um, and they did, and there's a whole bunch of studies in there. Those types of influence books uh, get to, when you start to understand how our brain is influenced, we can use tactics um, that are more easily adapted to get other people to understand where you're coming from. And then listen, then turn around and listen to understand what that did to them. This is what these books did to me, right? Um, 
Vanessa Bonds, you have more influence than you think. She used to be out also. Um, another really interesting book. Um, and it made, she might have been talking about social and uh, social media. Physical. Yeah. I get these books mixed up. So there are these, those three books, see what Robert C.L.D. Tally shared in Vanessa Bonds, are three books on influence that I've read several times to try to understand what influences are human, right? Well, I mean, we know when we burn ourselves, we won't touch that hot pan again. As a kid, we didn't know it was hot. Once our brain creates that circuit, but we don't do it again. We think we have to suffer in a consequence and go through an entire uh, causal factor and tap root so we, that thing never happens again. But often we've gone through all this exercise for well, exercise for a thing that's actually an anomaly. Right. And what we really need to do, if we understood what influenced that decision, then we can we can change our even our subconscious decisions in a way that changes the outcome. So that thing that we spent all that time ever on never happens. And that's a hard thing. I, can people really wrap their head around how to fix things before they happen? I, 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 that's what it's I, a rough. It's a rough one, you know. And I think it takes like probably a lot of well, like you said, experience. But one of the things that a lot of crews have is the people who have been on the crew for a long time that have seen a lot of different things happen that know the environment. Um, and so like sometimes you and I talk about, you know, predicting the future, which in my mind, I always think of like the psychic friends network. Like I'm not a psychic <laughs> bill. I cannot predict the future, but there are lots of things actually that you can predict. Like one of the things you mentioned once was, you know, like vacation, like you can predict like, Hey, I'm going to be in this place this month at this time. Um, so that is predicting the future and you're like working toward that. So there are things that you can predict and then you can look at, okay, well, if I don't want this to come true, what are the things that we need to do? And we have a lot of people in the industry who, if given the opportunity, they can predict that some of those things will happen. Absolutely. So Lisa Feldman Barrett again talks about a lot about predictions and and that's and people don't like that word um, mm -hmm. because they take exactly like you're saying the psychic friends next door and lottery numbers, right? But yeah. but the reality is that our brain is designed to predict the future. Um, I asked the, the, the uh, so I you know I, I, every day is a social experiment for me. So I'm always asking people, strangers, if I can ask them questions, and uh, I get in trouble sometimes. And most people are are, are pleasantly polite to me. Um, and this one guy, forty year, I had. A, he was a farmer. He was selling seeds. I was at a hotel doing a um, Arden with a company. I was doing some consulting, and I see he's got this seed thing. I said, "Oh, you sell seeds?" He said, "Are you a farmer?" He says, "Oh yeah, I don't anymore." He said, "I sell seeds. I got a small hobby farm at home." He said, "But you were you were a farmer?" He said, "Oh yeah." He said, "That forty years." I said, "What kind of farm? A harvest farm?" Oh, you so you planted seeds? Well, yeah, for forty years. I said, "So listen, can I, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, it's going to seem a little weird. I'm just doing a little social study." And he says, sure. Can you predict and create your future? He says, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. And 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 having read Lisa Feldman Barrett's book, I understand that that's the way our brain works, right? I mean, from the smallest thing that I predict I'm going to pick up a can of soda to the large thing I'm going to go on vacation, those planning is the prediction, right? And it's calculated. I mean, we put a rover on Mars. It didn't just show up there. Right? <laughs> so, so I said to him, I, I said, so you can't predict your creative future. He said, absolutely not. I said, that's that's really interesting. He said, what's so interesting about it? I said, I'm assuming you have harvest equipment. Oh, I got tons of harvest equipment. I said, I had, I, had, I can't remember how many acres he told me that. I said, and you you would like, you would plant rows of seeds? I said, yeah, yep, yep. So let me get this straight. You can't predict and create your future, but every year you planted seeds and you didn't think they would grow. And then you bought harvest equipment to, to harvest it, but it, for for crops you didn't even have? Mm -hmm. I said, isn't that kind of silly? If you don't think you can predict it? <laughs> and he laughed, right? I was, yeah. was, um, I, 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 I've asked people in uh, in conferences and in, in consulting, you know, uh, can you predict the future? Oh, no, oh, no, no. What time did you show up at work today? I said, on 7 o'clock. They said, when did you decide you were coming? Like when you showed up? Or <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm going to guess you probably know about what time you'll be at home and what route you're going to take. I said, I, if we put a GPS uh, locator on almost all of us, We'd be surprised how patterned our days are that we follow the same pathways. You know, we get up yep. at the same time. I go to get the dog, same dog food. I walk to the same routes. So, so what the best thing to do to keep your mind stretched is to purposely disrupt that pattern. 
Because when you do, yes. your brain starts to pick up other things. And the interesting thing about, back to the um, Viscontis' book, she talks about BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. That's for neuroplasticity, to increase the connections. And that, we used to think our brain got a certain amount of brain cells and when you're at birth and that was it. They were wrong. BDNF is what you need to create more connections. And the more exercise you get and the more active you keep your brain, the more BDNF is produced. So so you, if, if imagine if you lived in a room your entire life, the one room. You got up, you slept, ate, did everything in the room. You're, yeah, it was called COVID. Yeah. Right, right. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're, and my you're, brain felt terrible. Your universe will be really small. Yeah. And your experience will be small. So you go up and there to go outside and that breath of fresh cold air hitting you in the face would be something you've never experienced before. The more things we can experience, experientially experience, mm -hmm. the more circuits our brain make to understand it, right? Well, and the less likely we are to be experientially blind and not kind of know what we're doing um, when we're in a situation. So in other words, Lisa Feldman Barrett uses right, experiential blindness, right? So when you burn your finger on the pan because you didn't know it was hot and you were blind to it. Yep. So, so, so what, you know, what's people are having trouble wrapping their head around is when, when we, act, we, we don't want an optimism bias, but Tally Sherrod, she wrote that book. Um, uh, I don't think I listened to it here, but, uh, uh, we all have that. We don't think it's going to happen to us. We don't like thinking about the bad thing. Matter of fact, when I ask you about your, your future vacation, this is proven in Vanessa Bond's book. This, no, this is Tally Sherrod's book, um, is an optimism bias is when you, Start thinking about the future. You paint a very rosy picture about what that vacation is going to look like. Oh, this is going to be great. Sun tan, you see sunshine bathing suits, the whole day, deal. Um, when we think about the future, we always paint it positive, which is really healthy because that makes us do it. But the reality is life isn't doesn't work that way. So we have to look at what the pitfalls, what are the things that are going to stop us? Mm -hmm. And until our brain experiences that, even in thought, um, it doesn't create the mitigation plan. Right, so you did create a, a mitigation not to burn your finger on the pan, right? We don't. Lo, 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 workers don't want to think about breaking their leg on uneven ground. They don't want to think about uh, getting heat stroke on a hot day. They don't want to think about getting electrocuted in a bucket. You know, but is there something that accounts for like anxiety or whatever? Because I know there must be some people that are like they're going to go on a vacation, but they automatically start thinking about. Oh my god! Like, what if my plane is late, or like, what if the reservations aren't at the hotel, or what if this happens? Um, like, what is that? So, so that's another really good. So that that is an emotion, mm -hmm. right? So worry and fear are emotions, right? So, and and it's been proven that your heart rate increases, uh, and you're afraid because your heart rate increases, not because if your heart doesn't increase because you're afraid. It's actually in the reverse. Um, that's the proof. Weird. They can do that with EEGs. Like when you think about getting a drink of water, they can look at EEGs and watch your brain go into action, start sending the signal like uh, 300 milliseconds before you even thought of it and, drew, and said you're going to go get the water. So our brain is a predictor. It has to be because right now we're in the present. Oh, that's going on. That's the past. Everything <laughs> we do is in the future. Everything we do is in the future. So if if you we start making an effort to actually recognize I, I, there, an incident happened, uh, I can't say where, because I don't want to embarrass anybody, but an employee pot, pointed out a, br a bad breasted pipe, large pipe hanging with a bad hanger, and he reported it. And then the thing falls down, they have this little investigation. Well, and then concerned it by somebody with that much intuition because they've been working at this place for 20 years, uh, has a higher um, on value than somebody who's just come for six months, right? So... But it, so then that employee says, I'm concerned. That's a prediction of an unwanted outcome. Yeah. It happened and they got lucky. The real problem is nobody listened to it. So and that we, happens often, I think. So we have a whole population of workers that that's happening to because the social, the people living in the managers in, in, that are not anymore working in the physical reality listen to it. And the response is very similar. They'll say, listen, that should be fine. Uh, you know, well, yeah, we understand, but this is what we need to do today because they have their own agenda. Mm -hmm. And what that does is that person will become learned helpless. And, and that was from uh, um, another book that I talked about in another podcast. I can't think of it. Martin Seligman, Learned Helplessness. Um, so 
that that bring if you if you it, so if it's not safe for you to contribute as in as in uh, Tim V R Clark, you'll just stop contributing. And there's a there's a poster out there that says you know we're in trouble when your most vocal employees become silent. Yep, that's yeah, that's a big red flag. So so, so all the red red flags are there. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, so I I don't know how long we've been going at. Um, Lisa Barrett uh, also mentions. Um, Another book by Andy Clark, The Experience Machine, How Our Minds Predict and Shape Reality. He also, he's from Sussex, he's a PhD. He wrote a paper in 1997, Where Does the Mind Stop and the World Begin? And and it turns out that our our hands, our arms, our mind goes everywhere that we are focused and attention. So like now we have these iPhones and our mind is in the iPhone because it, it reserves space for cognitive thought because we can put things there, right? Mm -hmm. And and I like to joke about that. In 2007, they proved Andy Clark right because in 2007, when the iPhone came out, they realized if you lose your iPhone, you lose your mind. Yeah, it's like a psychological, like, yeah, create. Well, I also think there's something to be said for the fact that, like, there are no pay phones or anything really anymore either. It's like, you know, they've, the iPhone has replaced a lot of stuff. And then if you don't have those things, like, how are you supposed to make a call or communicate with anybody? So it is sort of like a psychological hijack of some kind. So based on on Andy Clark's some of Andy Clark's work, um, Annie and Paul, two thousand twenty one. Uh, Andy Clark's book was published in May two thousand twenty three. It's the only thing. Science is moving at light. And they have AI now, right? At light yes. speed, we're still using tools from fifty years ago, right? The hierarchy of controls was nineteen fifty, right? Um, human performance started in eighteen sixty seven. The uh, Swiss cheese model, James Reason, was 2000. That's 24 years ago. Jane, um, Andy Clark's book, The Experience Machine, was 2023, May. Annie and Paul's book, 2021, The Expen Extended Mind, The Power of Thinking Outside the Brain. Right? They found out that we we tell kids when they go to school they need to sit still in order to learn. They need to sit still and stop visiting at their desk. It's totally not true. They've proven we need to move. Henry did with your movement to walk in order to, to write. Um, so many people get ideas. You go for a walk in the woods and these ideas come to you without your permission. Moving, Absolutely. Yeah. Moving in space improves your cognitive ability. So um, Daniel Kahneman in the streets of London and in California was walking with um, Amos Traversky when he wrote Thinking Fast and Slow. And as he says, he quotes, the best thinking I've ever done was in when he, Amos and I would go on walks and talk about this book. So yeah, I I agree. Yeah. So so it's, I mean, I don't have to agree. It's it's this is science. This is it's proven, right? I mean, it's good that you agree, but it's it, it's the <laughs> truth, right? And 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 Daniel Kahneman, thinking fast and slow. That was 2011. Every cognitive psychologist refers to his work, right? Mm -hmm. Amos didn't get the Nobel Prize. Um, he got a Nobel Prize in economics for writing the book, and that's a really weird story. So I'm not going to tell you, but uh, it's a it, it, he missed died, so he didn't get get anything for this. But but he talks about system one and system two thinking. System one being your fast brain, system two your slow brain. And we've done a bunch of things with that on other podcasts. But we really like stuff that makes sense to our the system one brain when it's easy. Like this, you know, we talk about the Swiss cheese model in the past, or 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 the the tap root, or asking five whys. Where did the five whys come from? I don't know. I have no idea. It's like when I asked Lineman, where did the hammer test come from for that old pole? I don't know. And they don't, you know, but, but but nobody's giving them credit for being so smart about bulls that the only reason they have in their hand to test it is because they've already decided that the bull is a piece of crap, right? Yeah. So, so when we start listening to our workers and engaging them and asking those four questions, what do you think? Those four words engage a whole nother process that we don't have part, we're not privy to if we're coming in strong and hot like an airplane. Right, um, and delivering our message because that's the most important thing. So I, I'm, uh, I have other books, but I don't know how much longer you want to go. This has been a while. Well, yeah, I almost think that we should do maybe another one in the future. Um, I, I think, I think let's let's see, let's let your um, listening audience decide. Um, okay. Uh, I, I think they, if they want to know more, I've got tons of books. Um, uh, I will mention one more: the Checklist Manifesto, Atul Gawande. That he wrote in 2009, which is a study of Johns Hopkins. 
then it determine before operations that go, go around the room with the experimental group, what identify yourself, your role, and any, any concern you have. And that, for everybody in the room, that was practicing speaking up, like practicing the violin or like, you know, you plant corn, you get corn, right? So that's cool. Oh. So they, the study showed they were 80% more likely to speak up during op- the operation if they saw something that they should, maybe should speak up because it was more, it was easier to contribute uh, to, to the Arclux point. So that's one of the tactics that I'm working on with the, with crews right now. And and they're un- if you ask what's your role, what's your concern, it's an opportunity for you to express what's concerning you. I mean, if I'm next to you, I might be the one concerning you. I don't know. We, so we, it, won't be, it won't be written on the job brief until you say it, right? Mm-hmm. So, I, yeah, I, if you're all right, I, I just, I would like to, this, this is something new that we're doing, right? I, this idea. But I, I want to encourage people to be careful not to get stuck on the safety gurus. That's really good information and you need to read it. But we also need to understand the how. How do we influence better? What things are barriers to influence? What things are we doing that's making our influence less? And that three-day course you just took, you you owe it to yourself to pick something from that course and apply it to whatever you're doing and try it. And then you decide if it's of any value. If it's not, get rid of it because you don't need it. Try something else. Mm-hmm. And that's I, I think that's what we're not doing. And that's why we're not changing the statistics in our industry. We're not looking at how we are influenced. We think it's the information that we need to have, right? I mean, look at there's an incident. First thing we do is retraining the crew, right, or or stand them down, and we do all these things over and over again, and the result continues to be the same. So. Right. Well, that yeah, I I love all your insights, Bill, and I want to thank you so much for your time today. Um, and I also really want to thank our listeners for spending their valuable time with us. Um, and I hope you'll join Bill and I again soon for another episode of Influencing Safety. In the meantime, stay safe and be well. The views, information, and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of utility business media and its employees. It is strongly recommended that you discuss any actions or policy changes with your company management prior to implementation.